I'm Scott Al Miller. This is my life living in Leon, Nicaragua. Today, we're going to be doing something completely different on this show. We're actually partnering with a new sister publication called Latin American Living, and we have a number of episodes that have been recorded and a few that are coming up pretty soon. And I have a day when we we're without internet here due to the tropical storms hitting the country. So because of that, we're actually going to be moving up a release of an episode where we're doing an interview and announcing the new show. So we're going to talk about that briefly and get to the interview with Eric Peterson of Generic Expats right after the bump. So on today's show, we're going to be showing a video version of a cut down, uh, edited interview with Eric Peterson, who is with Generic Expats, a YouTube channel that discusses living across Latin America, relocation, retirement, helping you decide on what country and region and city and all those kinds of things to do across the entire region, which is really interesting. Eric was here in Nicaragua about seven months ago. We did some interviews uh, out in Las Pinitas. He interviewed with a lot of YouTubers here in Nicaragua, and we're going to throw up on the uh, links up above here a link to the first of a series of interviews that he and I did together uh, seven months ago. So you can see on his channel, uh, give him some love, go subscribe to that, but make sure you come back here to watch the interview. Now, this interview is being done with our sister publication. We have a new podcast that we're soft announcing now. It was mentioned briefly on the live stream, but I want to make kind of a formal announcement now as to what we're doing and uh, where it's going to be. So traditional podcast, not a YouTube show, but an actual podcast called Latin American Living. You're going to want to subscribe on things like uh, Apple Podcasts, podcast, Spotify, those types of tools. And it's going to be a more traditional podcast audio style format. There may be some video elements. We're working out exactly how we're going to handle a lot of the recording and we're going to try some things out and see what happens in the future. But for most of you, it's going to be audio only. If you're subscribing through traditional podcast channels, it's going to be interviews and uh, discussion panels primarily uh, around the whole the concept of living in Latin America, relocating to moving around Latin America, retiring in Latin America, uh, but not just from an expert perspective. But from a more general perspective, we're going to be talking to a lot of people who just live in Latin America and exploring their lives here, whether they are in uh, their, their home location or have moved around Latin America. We really want to dig into life across the entire region, which is a perfect segue into talking to generic expats and Eric Peterson from there because that's exactly the kind of stuff that they do. Of course, this channel, we often talk about life in Latin America, but it's very focused on a combination of our travels and living here in Nicaragua, where I'm based. So it's a lot more focused just kind of naturally. And we're a vlog rather than an official uh, Latin American travel and relocation channel. So the podcast is definitely going to be very different and certainly a lot lower energy, more NPR ish than uh, what the show is here. I have a tendency to have a lot of energy here. Uh, and, and obviously you guys like that. So this is going to be a little bit different. I've got two interviews that are very uh, uh, timely because of the stuff going on with so many people looking to relocate to Nicaragua that that I've got an interview that we've already done with Eric Peterson that we're going to show now, and then we've got an upcoming one coming pretty soon. Both of these are, are relatively long format, so they'll have their own episodes with Jeff Bramwell doing the same thing from Latin American Living, talking about uh, Canadians specifically coming to Latin America. So we're going to be doing those. This is just a different thing. We're not quite live yet, so you can't go grab Latin American Living quite yet, but you're going to be able to get it really soon. Uh, we're working to get that up. Of course, our internet's out right now, so we were in the process of editing the episodes to get them up, and we're not able to follow through on the very final publishing. So hopefully, really quickly, we're going to have that for you, but you're getting a teaser now. And uh, as soon as we have everything, we'll put every link that we possibly can down below to promote that. Of course, we expect a very different audience over there, So, but if, if my audience here wants to support us, that would be Absolutely fantastic. I appreciate it so much. And without further ado, let's get to that interview. I'm your host, Scott Allen Miller, and welcome to Latin American Living. Today, I have with me remotely from Colombia, Eric Peterson, also known as the generic expat. Today, we're going to be talking now his focus in general with his media, uh, his YouTube channel, his content uh, is very much on and in alignment with us here at Latin American Living of a pan Latin American uh, relocation and living uh, and, and to some degree travel experience. But we are uh, today, I'm going to be touching on the recent topic that just came up uh, or, or its context with relocation within the Latin American sphere of the, the idea that many 
Canadians are suddenly really seriously looking at relocation options. And in the very specific case that Nicaragua here in the middle of Latin America came up as a very specific target uh, to which they were potentially traveling to. And uh, Eric has some experience with Canadians, of course, and with Nicaragua in general. So welcome him here to the podcast. Eric, great to have you here. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Scott. As I am, always good to be able to chat with you and, and just go ahead and riff on some in- interesting topics that we both know a lot about. Yeah, it's great. I'm so glad you're here. We've done some videos together on our YouTube channels previously, and uh, always great to have a, a good discussion. So, Eric, so so give me kind of your impression. So you've been talking to people for, for years and have lived for quite some time in Latin America. So you have this really strong background in, in, in a broad area in Latin America. Over the last, especially two years, I think, do you feel that we're looking at, at like an increase? We don't know about like relocation metrics, right? But in the uh, in the space where uh, people are looking at media or having conversations about relocation, do you feel that there is, especially from the global north and in this region, especially from North America, um, a, a, an increase in in at least interest in Latin America and relocation in general? Yeah, absolutely. So first, I want to talk a little bit about what you mentioned before, my experience in Latin America. So <clears throat> I studied for a year and a half in South America, Chile and Brazil. And then I spent about a total of maybe seven years with between South America and Mexico. Now, me driving down and then going through Nicaragua, where we, where we met in Leon, that was my first time in Central America. So Central America was fairly new to me until recently. And then I got quite a deep dive into that where I spent like a year and a half in mostly Central America. And yeah, I met a lot of Canadians. Actually, the most Canadians I met, the largest number were besides Nicaragua was Costa Rica. And yeah, there there were quite a few there. I mean, I've met quite a few as well in Mexico and currently I'm in Colombia. So I haven't actually met any in Colombia now. I'm not sure if that's because it's a low, a low number or because I just, I'm not like, you know, going directly seeking them out. So sure. Sure. In, in terms of Costa Rica, I was actually receiving my mom and my sister on vacation. So we went to a bunch of resort or nice like touristic areas. And that's where we bumped into them, which they were all really friendly, had a great time. And yeah, so it seems like it's just a general overall trend that North Americans are looking for places, especially because of the fact that there's so many people that are looking at retirement or are retiring or already retired. And th- that generation is the biggest generation in the history of the U.S., from, if I'm not mistaken. So Absolutely. this is a huge group of people, and they're looking to go somewhere and not have their money just evaporate, <laughs> which <laughs> basically is guaranteed in the U.S. If, you, if you're going to spend your days there, especially if you're going into a nursing home, it's gone. All the money you made in your entire life is going to be eaten up by that. And that's, I mean, I don't have the st- statistics, but from what I'm seeing online and, and lots of people's comments about the, the current environment, the, the basically the not so much retirement, but, you know, getting old and having someone take care of you, that's insanely expensive. And those options are actually available in Central America. For example, in Guatemala, one of the first interviews I did was in Antigua. And I, 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 I talked to a woman that actually opened up a center that wasn't exactly a, an area for like retirement or assisted living type of type of thing but it was kind of in a way an area for older elderly people to come live and and basically share experiences with each other kind of an older type of end of the you know higher age type of situation sure what we would call a senior living center senior living that's the one so that's something I, I experienced firsthand as I saw that. And I'm like, oh, I didn't even know this existed in, in Latin America. I thought it was just a kind of America, you know, a US thing. And I saw that in Guatemala and Antigua. I haven't seen any yet, but I, you know, like I said, I haven't like been like thoroughly searching for it to see if it exists in other countries or not. But yeah, in in overall, in an overall summary, I think it's a big part of, I mean, for my generation and and for people between, you know, whatever, like graduating and becoming, you know, their 
they're getting their first real job. A lot of people are becoming remote as, as well of what that age group you're talking about. A lot of them moved to Mexico City. Oh, now, absolutely. I think that was around uh, the COVID times when basically every company is like, we want you to work, but you need to, you know, you need to work and they all wanted to be in the same time zone. So a lot of them wanted mm -hmm. to go to places like in your region where you are, Central America, Mexico, you're leaving to Europe and Asia. I mean, especially with like COVID happening, it wasn't really a possibility, but yeah, you can just drive down through the border. If the, if the land borders were open or not, I'm not sure, but yeah, when they were open, you could just fly down and you're, you know, three, four, five hours from whatever place in the U S basically you can be from. So yeah, I noticed that quite a bit when I was living in Mexico, starting my, my generic expats channel, which by the way, I'm not the generic expat. Remember we talked about this in my, <laughs> in, in my interview with you. I'm not even an expat. All right. I'm a digital nomad that makes him Information for people that are thinking about becoming the expat or immigrant person moving abroad. So it's not really me giving <laughs> you information about my life as an expat. I'm more just doing digital nomad investigative research, you could say. Exactly. So anyways, yeah, yep. that's, that's my kind of point of view on that generation is that the younger generation, <clears throat> they, yeah, they're, they're definitely like easing into this like more common type of remote living, digital nomad, whatever type of living style. I actually had a, um, I had a video call, a consultation call with a man that is going to become a re re uh, remote worker or a digital nomad, actually from Minnesota as well. I'm from Minnesota, right? So we also, you and I both share that proximity to the Canadian border, very close. We're not, we're not part of the, you know, the U.S. South where we were just super far away and we don't really have that connection. I mean, you and I, we both have that really close connection and I'm like, you know, five, four or five hours from the border, which in the U.S. is close. Right. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, that this consultation call, he mentioned, oh yeah, I'm living in Florida. I'm from Minnesota, but I want to continue working because he's, uh, I think, I didn't, I didn't get his age, but um, I think he might be in his 40s or something. And he, uh, he mentioned that he was going to do this. And I gave him all the best um, advice I could give. And if anyone is interested in getting my perspective and, and a very, very concrete, detailed, but also personalized uh, suggestions from me, you can check out my website, genericsworld.net, and then arrange a, a consultation video call if you want to talk about that with me. I think I have some value to offer. It might not be the best in the world, but it's some of the best you can get with my seven, eight years of experience in Latin America. So yeah, my, my current trip, my current channel is me detailing my life in videos because before when I did all these, uh, I did all this time in these countries, I didn't document, I didn't, I mean, I wrote some pictures, I wrote some like some, some stories or some, it was mostly on social media on Facebook. I wrote like, oh, this is this place. And I posted a cool picture and that was pretty much it, you know, but now I'm, I'm trying to get as much, as detailed as possible, give as much value as possible from my experiences. And yeah, so I did six months in Mexico when I started this. Uh, this video project. And then I did every country I did minimum five weeks. So I think the, the shortest amount of time I spent was in Honduras because of that CA4 visa is so complicated. And I wanted to spend, I mean, I spent like 10 weeks in Guatemala. I love Guatemala. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I spent like two and a half months there, which uh, my plan was to spend around six months, six weeks in each. So yeah, I did 10 months in Guatemala and then El Salvador I went for six weeks, I think, or four. And then I ended up flying out, going to Peru and then flying back into <laughs> back to El Salvador. Okay, keep in mind, I was doing this all my I am doing this on my motorcycle. So it's not like right. I'm going around on buses or, or planes or anything. That one flight was just something uh, a side travel, side trip. I did a business trip. And then I flew back and then I did Honduras for about five weeks, like I mentioned. And then Nicaragua was next six weeks, I believe I had in, or eight weeks was it? I ended up having to pay a fine for my motorcycle permit <laughs> because I didn't realize they give really short permits. And then yeah. I did six weeks in Costa Rica, six weeks in Panama, and now I've already been uh, two and a half months in Co Colombia. So I've been trying to edit as much videos as I can from Central America. Yours is coming up today if I can finish editing part one. Because <laughs> we did such long interviews, oh I have gosh. to, <laughs> I have to, I have to make three parts because it's just, it's just too much to put into one video. <laughs> it's like that, okay, that's awesome. An hour and a half. Yeah. Okay, so with the the current topic that's going on, um, I want to address that a little bit specifically, just because this is. Um, I think a lot of, uh, specifically, a lot of Canadians want to see opinions on this very specific question that was brought up by Pierre uh, in the news maybe maybe 10 days ago. 
that he interviewed uh, a woman whose family had moved from, I believe, actually originally Squamish, if I have the news correctly, to Cape Breton. So they came from the west coast of Canada, which has become very expensive, to the east coast, which is relatively inexpensive. Um, I actually honeymooned in Cape Breton and a beautiful area, not so expensive. And they still felt it was unaffordable for their family. They were fishermen. And so they ended up moving to Nicaragua because they felt that it was uh, the best option for them to raise their kids. And they were not, it seemed clearly like passionate Nicaraguan residents. They are certainly appreciative and seem very happy, but they, they expressed, they wished that the economic conditions allowed them to go back to Canada, uh, that they would prefer to be there, but, but were happy with Nicaragua as, uh, as their uh, fallback option, I guess, is the best way to put it. And so many people now, from Canada, from the U.S. and other places as well, but specifically in this case, so many Canadians, I think, are looking at Nicaragua in Central America and saying, okay, I'm, I'm not really familiar with this place. I'm only with, I'm only existing with a cursory knowledge, mostly from U.S. news, mostly that's old. Um, and of course, <laughs> I think especially Canadians know not to necessarily trust uh, U.S. government reports or U.S. news reports, but they're not sure where else to get information. So that makes it difficult. Nicaragua kind of represents a black hole of knowledge to much of the world. For the Canadians who are now researching Nicaragua, who are wondering, is this uh, a potential place? Is it, um, and they, their number one concern is definitely, is it cost effective? Um, is it a good cost of living? especially compared to Canada, but also very importantly compared to the rest of the region, right? Is it good compared to Mexico, Guatemala, Colombia, uh, and so forth? And uh, is, it, is it safe? Because safety has is, is become a major concern for Canadians and, and kind of always has been because Canada itself traditionally has been very safe and is now seeing an uptick or a believed uptick in, in crime and people are, are becoming worried about their own communities in Canada. I see that uh, all the time. Um, but going to another country, traditionally Canadians have good reason to, I don't know if fear is correct, uh, but uh, coming from most other countries in, in the Western Hemisphere, moving to other countries, we all kind of have a similar, there's a certain heightened level of, of danger everywhere. So we're, we're all kind of the same. But Canada traditionally has been so much safer that they have a different context and the whole world, whether it's the US or, or Chile or Brazil, it doesn't matter. Everything's more dangerous than Canada. Traditionally, so they have this concern about safety in a way that most of us just don't think of. So I, those are the, the top questions. What do you feel, uh, what is your opinion to Canadians who are wondering cost, uh, a cost of living analysis in Nicaragua and safety in Nicaragua? Are these things that they should be concerned about? How, they sh how should they be looking at this? Yeah, so those are <clears throat> pretty solid points for wanting to leave a country. Those are push factors, right? If you don't feel like you're getting a good quality of life with what is offered, what is available in terms of jobs and cost, I mean, it makes sense, especially for people that aren't even working. I mean, if you're not working at all, which is the retiring uh, generation, the retiring age group, they're going to think, well, I only have this, what is it, the set cost of whatever, or the set amount yeah. that I the get fixed from income. Social, fixed income, social security, whatever they get. Um, yeah, if they if they have a set amount and inflation continues to rise, which it, I don't believe it's going down, in the US at least, I believe it's still around 5%, which is, is pretty high. And we don't know if it'll go down anytime soon. So that's definitely a, a worry. That's a sign of concern. And so, yeah, if, if you're trying to leave somewhere, I mean, going to the U.S. is not going to really lower your cost of living unless you go to a really undesirable place. And of course, that's not the intention, right? You're like, OK, I need to leave <laughs> my great quality of life, very expensive to this low quality of life, but cheaper. It's like, well, no, not really exactly the, the point. The point is finding a place where you can spend less and get more and maybe even contribute more with your with your exotic or your new interests that you're bringing to the table, right? So if you're coming to a new place, you can say, hey, you know, I like doing this or that. You know, I meant, remember seeing in your videos, you talk about how Canadians have their own community. They've really come down from Canada, a huge group compared to the rest of the other groups. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, you said Can Canadians are the biggest expat groups. In in Nicaragua specifically, Nicaragua. yes, Canadians yeah. have long represented the the primary uh, and and closely followed by the U.S. Of course, but very unique for the region. I actually, um, when I lived in Vietnam, I had the same 
the same environment when I lived in Hanoi. So I lived in the two major cities. Hanoi was the area that was never colonized by the U.S. Uh, South. Saigon mm-hmm. was the, the U.S. South, right? The U.S. took over and that was the Americanized South. And then I lived there and I, the majority of the expats were from the U.S. And I was like, huh, this is interesting. I went there on vacation on my first time. And I was like, wow, there's so many Americans here. Well, I guess, <laughs> I guess it makes sense. It used to be part of America or was a colony or whatever. And then when you go up to the north in Hanoi, that was the most curious part. And that was the first place I lived in Vietnam because it was mostly British and Scottish. And I was like, wait, Americans are, are minority here? What a, what a curious <laughs> detail. Like I wasn't expecting, yeah. you know, half and half to be completely different. So yeah, when you bring, bring up <clears throat> Canada and Nicaragua having more Canadians, I mean, it totally makes sense due to the history of the U.S. basically having these problems with Nicaragua. Same thing with Hanoi, the U.S. having these problems with Northern Vietnam. They have the same kind of situation where it's, the undesirable place for Americans because of, I guess our history doesn't like promote it. And that's kind of the situation with Nicaragua. Yeah. Well, even in popular American culture, we have a romanticized vision of Saigon, right? Maybe because of the musical, right? But Saigon (laughs) has this very iconic um, in, in cinema, in music, in, in popular culture, especially if you're like my age where all that was, was very recent uh, and Hanoi may have, you know, we know it well, but it was the place we never went, of course. And so it's not in the same in popular culture. It's just this far off place that that was that was scary. And so it represents kind of a, a fearful place. So that makes that makes sense, I think, coming from the United States. But it's very interesting that that just that division of the country is so, so dramatic. So from uh, so obviously cost of living here in Nicaragua, very strong. Right. It's one of the lowest costs of living. Um, we generally, and I don't know how accurate this is, but we generally compare it to Colombia as the two leaders in, in general cost of living. I know Paraguay competes really well, uh, but Colombia generally outpaces everyone in South America. Nicaragua generally outpaces everyone in North America, both for, uh, and someone's going to fact check me on this and, and get me, but in general, Nicaragua has North America's strongest purchasing power parity. And I believe that Colombia actually might be even stronger. It's, it's, we generally give Colombia the lead in cost of, uh, cost of living comparisons, but it's very close, very competitive. So I'll jump in here and I'll mention a little bit about my trip down because I, you know, I was battling with the change in currency and the change in prices (laughs) and everything as I went from Mexico all the way down here to Colombia, currently in Colombia and the Colombian peso is very unstable. So that's one thing about currencies and about Nicaragua that actually is very, it's quite a bit nicer because it's pegged, right? It's pegged to the dollar or pegged to whatever. Whereas the Colombian peso is very wild. I mean, it was 5,000, it was free floating, it was, it was 5,000 pesos to the dollar a year ago. Now it's 3,800, a massive difference. Quite wow. a bit more expensive than before, but it's still very, very cheap. So, I mean, when it was 5,000, it was insanely cheap for new, anyone with dollars, <clears throat> uh, US dollars. So, yeah, yeah Colombia definitely seems to be, um, when I compare it back to all these other countries I've been to in this past two years on this trip, I mean, I've spent a lot of time in Mexico before I knew, but that's also another currency that's just very wild. I mean, it was at... Yeah. 21 20 the first time i went there to the dollar and now it's it's been up and down between 16 and 18 now with the new president it kind of bumped up a little bit and so yeah cost of living in, in mexico if the, the peso continues to stay strong is not going to be super favorable for for anyone from the us or canada um, unless you go to very unknown less touristy or less popular places. Right, right. I mean, places like Cancun are super expensive. Puerto Vallarta is also, especially for accommodation in most of these places, just super expensive. Um, I did mean well, actually, it's, it's probably... It's worth noting real quickly, our producer of this show, Valentina, is a Mexican expat living in Argentina because <laughs> Mexico got so expensive that it's it's just Mexico... Uh, Mexicans uh, living in Mexico are in the same boat as Americans and Canadians that expatting to much of Latin America is actually becoming very attractive because uh, because Mexico uh, just has such a powerful economy and great for Mexico, right? If you're there and you're a business person and you're able to to reap the benefits of that powerful economy right now, uh, they're they're just doing fantastic. So so kudos to them. But it is it is moving Mexicans very oddly into the boat of being 
powerful spenders throughout much of the region. Yeah, right. I didn't uh, I didn't realize that was happening. That's one of the few times I've heard. I mean, I've heard of, I've seen and met many Latin Americans that have moved to Asia because Asia is actually uh, a version of Latin America that is in general far safer, far cheaper. And if you get certain jobs, you can get paid pretty well comparatively to the Latin American wages available. So I actually met Guatemalans. I met tons of Mexicans in Vietnam when I lived there, which mm-hmm. I was like, oh, I was like, just like Colombians. I have a good Colombian friend from Bogota she, or Pucaramanga. I can't remember, but she, I met her in Hanoi as well. And just so many friends have, have, you know, left Latin America for that same reason. Oh, better opportunities, maybe safer, you know, all, all of the main points that are very important for moving abroad that ticked all of their boxes, right? They say, okay, mm-hmm. Lower cost of living. I mean, I'm in a like low cost of living country, but it's cheaper. Oh my god, you know, and <laughs> it's safe, much safer. I mean, most places are safer than Latin America, according to statistics. I mean, these are all the things that you have to keep in consideration because these statistics are not generally what you should concern yourself about because they are generally for what people involved in mafia or drug related work should concern themselves about because we have sure. basically no reason to be concerned about this homicide rate in Mexico, for example. I've spent two years in Mexico and I didn't feel really scared or like any concern except for one specific time in Cancun. Cancun's a bit dangerous in my point of view. I I would agree. Yeah. So I definitely wouldn't suggest Cancun for a place to become an expat, both because of the the dangers and the cost of living. Overall, I just think it's, I mean, it's beautiful for vacation. I think that's it. Uh, so yeah, when it comes to t- statistics, um, statistically, Asia is safer. And statistically, because of all the recorded, you know, gang violence, Latin America statistically is more dangerous. However, will that affect you and I? Pr- probably 0%, right? So that's just, things people should keep into consideration. That's a Mexico thing. And then, of course, you're talking about cost of living, which basically the rest of Central America besides Costa Rica is quite a bit cheaper. I wouldn't say Panama is much cheaper, but it's probably similar. It's noticeably cheaper, yeah. Yeah, I guess, uh, now I come to think about it, yeah. it's Because I, I remember when I was in Mexico back coming through, I mean, I, I always, the main way I look at cost of living for a country is, is comparing the cost of a standard almuerzo, lunch. And the, the, the standard lunch of just a regular place, not just fancy, not like the, the cheapest, just the average place. Yeah, I could find that in Panama for $4. Mm-hmm. Three fifty four four fifty was the standard price. Three fifty to four fifty, which is quite quite low price. And then in Mexico, I mean, it's now with the peso so strong as well, it's probably at six six dollars or more. So like around eighty pesos or hundred pesos is pretty standard. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's it's just kind of one of those things where you know things are constantly moving. You know, it's a free flow. You never know if Mexican peso. For example, if Trump is elected in the U.S., when Trump was elected in the U.S. in 2000, was it 16, right? 16, yep. When he was elected, the peso jumped from like 16 or 17 to 21. I mean, it did a huge jump. So that could possibly happen again, which Mm -hmm. would make Mexico like low cost again. So you don't really know what will happen. But as as for Nicaragua, which you're mentioning with Canada as well, Nicaragua has that pegged uh, currency. The right. Cordoba. For those who don't know, the Cordoba, the national currency here in Nicaragua, is pegged by the government on what's called a creeping peg. Now, this is modified a little bit, but it is essentially uh, the government sets a schedule for a movement of the peg. So we have a built in sm- very small amount of inflation, 1.5% uh, that moves over a period of time. And so on a set schedule, you can predict this. So people will exchange money and do things to prepare for the for the peg to change. And the national bank will move. So for example, we were at 36.5 Cordoba to the dollar. Uh, and about, I want to say two years ago, year and a half ago, uh, on a schedule, they moved to 37 to the dollar. But they, they give you months of warning. And when US inflation became higher than normal, because Nicaragua wants a certain level of inflation. So they do the, the creeping peg to guarantee that that inflation happens. When the US experienced higher inflation, Nicaragua put out a national bank notice that the creeping peg was being suspended and it was being held at a normal peg indefinitely until inflation returned. 
And so we've held at 37 far longer than expected because we're absorbing the additional U.S. inflation. So the nice thing is that using the system, we're very interesting. So I'm a, I'm a Wall Street foreign exchange trader right, for, for, as a career. And uh, I, I actually represented the U.S. dollar uh, on the technology side on Wall Street for 10 years. So, so currency is very interesting to me and, and something I, I'm kind of passionate about, even though I don't trade it actively now. The... Uh, the movement of the Cordoba, because it has this built-in creeping peg that they can suspend, they're able to, with relative ease, adjust for normal changes within the U.S. dollar in, in a really elegant way that allows the country to operate on dual currency and allows the country to deal with inflation issues abroad relatively well. Um, and it actually kind of works out kind of brilliantly. And a lot of people think, well, built-in inflation, that sounds bad. But from a from an economic standpoint, you really need inflation. You you actually should be really scared of deflation, which is what China has faced recently. That's a terrible thing. And people don't realize when you take out a bank loan and you're like, okay, over time, like I have a mortgage and that, you know, I'm paying $2,000 a month on my mortgage. And right now, oh, it's all I can do to pay it. But when I, in 30 years from now, two thousand with inflation, 2000 is going to be not that much. My salary is going to go up. This is going to be, they don't realize, they don't think about, no one ever articulates this. If you don't have inflation, if you had zero inflation, that 2000 a month would be just as painful in 30 years as it is today. And if you have deflation, like China's facing, people's mortgage payments, people's loan payments are exploding. They may owe the equivalent of 20% more, that would be extreme, but they may owe 10, 5 to 10% more per month than in rather than less per month and that is terrifying because you don't know how, you, you may be like at your limit and people think well but with inflation eventually i'll be okay and now with def deflation or or flat rate you're like anything goes wrong and you have no buffer so inflation is actually pretty important for the way a lot of a lot of the economy works um and nicaragua also has this unique position of being because of the the peg like Panama, which is a one-to-one -one peg, and Ecuador, which is just on the dollar, Nicaragua has this peg, which means that the national bank will always exchange your currency at exactly the rate, plus whatever fee you have to pay for, for the transaction. So it really never drifts, even if you're on the street, even if you're doing it abroad, because they can always go to the national bank. So you only ever have a difference that is covered by the convenience factor. I don't want to go to the bank. I'll pay slightly more to do it at the airport, right? Okay. But it'll never drift a lot because at some point people just go, I'm not going to do it at the airport. I'm going to go to the street and get it for 37. Because of that, every business is able to know what the exchange is rock solid. They don't have to look it up or anything. So everyone's able to take dual currencies and Nicaragua officially recognizes the US dollar as legal in the country. So you're able to do this completely transparent back and forth and pay for nearly everything in, in either currency. And what people also don't typically think about is that the bank accounts in Nicaragua actually can be opened in US dollars or in Cordoba, not in both. That would be weird and cause all kinds of problems. Your money would suddenly change with the peg. But the in in most countries, you're not allowed to or able to open a foreign currency bank account. You have one currency, that's what you can work with. If you're in Colombia, you can open a bank account in pesos. And and yes, you're allowed to have dollars, but mostly that's carried around in cash um, or have it in a foreign bank. But in Nicaragua, you can go to any bank in Nicaragua. And when you open a bank account, you have to select which currency you're going to open that account with. And businesses universally have two accounts. Well, it sounds like there's a lot of convenience of going to Nicaragua for that point, huh? That, that's a, it's convenient and it's good for the economy. It, it does work really well. Of course, being in some place like, you know, Guatemala, where they just have quetzales and there's one currency, it floats. So that makes for someone who's coming with foreign currency. And of course, Nicaragua is better for Americans because Canadians are still like, that's neither of those is my currency, right? So that's. <laughs> That's frustrating mm, for right. Canadians, but they face that everywhere. Uh, there's yeah, yeah. nobody that I know of that's that's sharing the Canadian currency. But the uh, the free floaters like like the Quetzales in Guatemala, um, you have uh, 
a little bit more economic power that when things are good, like you can leverage those differences a little bit more, more strongly, but it takes a little bit more effort to do so. And dealing with ATMs can be very frustrating because you can't go get US dollars when you need them. You you have to take whatever floating rate there is. You have to know what's going on. It takes a little bit more mental energy, but it does it does have some economic advantages as well. Floating is not a necessarily bad thing. It allows for more adjustments within the local economy, but you definitely From take- From my experience in Guatemala, just to butt in here, I was kind of surprised at how small the differences were from when I checked out the overall changes in the Quetzal. It's been pretty stable comparing it to the Colon, the Colon, right, in Costa Rica. And yep. um, the Peso, of course, those have just been wild up and down. Whereas the Quetzal, I, I think in the past 10 years, it's been between like seven and eight. So it's been like quite stable comparatively. But yeah, Guatemala definitely, um, you have to take out that local currency and there's a lot of just paying in cash, which is Colombia exactly the same. I mean, paying with a card here, you can you can do it in supermarkets like Exito, which is like, I don't know, the, the equivalent of Colonia, what's it called? Col- La Colonia. La Colonia, probably similar to that one. And um, yeah, of course, all of like the nicer places you can use cards. I use my card as much as possible because I use Charles Schwab. Charles Schwab, sponsor me. <laughs> I love using your card. Zero transaction fees for international payment. So I pay for everything I can with that card. It, it uses the daily rate of what the dollar is to whatever currency you're using. And it re- refunds the ATM. When you come to an ATM, they give you the money back that the ATM charges you. So it's just like mm-hmm. an amazing card for an expat. It's literally the card to have as, as an American. Now, I don't know if Canadians can take advantage of that because I think it's a, a, a strictly for the U.S. Um, citizen. So that's something to look into for Canadians if that's available or not. So I would suggest it if it definitely is. It may be I, because that's actually not an American bank. That's actually a Swiss bank. Right. They may offer that. It is a really powerful card, though. But it's worth noting that's a debit card. Right, right. right. Which is right, exactly which right, is yeah. the, the specialty thing. A lot of times when people are looking at cards, they're looking at uh, credit cards. Because you have some protections from credit cards, obviously, uh, and, and a lot of people want to use them for points. A lot of people want to use them for just the, the safety of a credit card. But if you're going to have a debit card, yeah, Charles Schwab is kind of the, the go-to, you know, expats need to know about it uh, kind of secret thing that if you're going to be doing those kinds of transactions, it's, it's kind of amazing. Yeah, definitely has the the lack of the lack of protection. That's for sure. So it's something to keep in mind, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, we could probably do a really great episode just talking about uh, card management, <laughs> yeah, right. right? And and which cards to have because um, and and I'm a big believer in the credit cards. Have four four completely unique processors so that if there's ever a problem with your processing, that you can switch cards and be like, this is going through a different channel. So if, even if some bank is down, because you'll see that right, connections to the banks will be down, and you'll be like, oh no, Visa's down, Master's cards down. Oh, thank goodness, American Express is still operating, <laughs> or vice versa. Yeah, and uh, that diversity can be can be important. So that, yeah, I think there's a lot of people don't think about it until you move. And then you're like, I, now I have to rethink all of my, all my plastic, um, but it can be an important part of travel. Yeah, so, definitely. okay. So we touched on the safety in Nicaragua from a, um, how to read the stats perspective, right? Yeah, yeah. But the stats in Nicaragua already say that it's safe, right? So, so that's useful, especially if you're in Mexico, especially if you're in Guatemala, places that are listed as scary. Uh, Costa Rica, right? Costa Rica statistically uh, is right up there with Guatemala as one of the the, the more dangerous countries. And, and certainly those statistics represent an overall crime. What's interesting is Mexico and Guatemala, that's known to be cartel crime, right? Like we know those are cartels. Costa Rica is not. It is a more general crime. So Costa Rica actually, my understanding of the statistics is that Costa Rica is actually the most dangerous country in the Western Hemisphere for a tourist. If you're an expat or a tourist, it is the most likely place where the crime that exists, which is on the high side, not super high, but on the high side, 300 plus percent that of Nicaragua or the US. So that's that's noticeable. Yeah, yeah. It is, is very general or, or more general compared to most countries. Uh, oh, whereas wow. in Guatemala or Mexico, yes, the stats are much higher and Honduras, of course but are extremely focused on 
specific areas, specific activities, specific people and tourists by and large. And of course, you hear horror stories from Mexico, but you have to remember the size of the Mexican tourism market, right? You could have a hundred tourists kidnapped and murdered every year in Mexico. And that's still a horrible thing, but it is a tiny statistical number compared to most countries who the average country has less than, I'm going to make up a number, but less than 1% the tourism traffic of Mexico. It has so many tourists that it throws everything off. Yeah, those are really good points. Yeah. So when I go to Mexico or Guatemala, I feel completely safe. In Costa Rica, I mostly feel safe, but it's palpable that it is not safe like Guatemala or Mexico when you're in Costa Rica from, from my perspective. So I didn't even know about the uh, the general crime stat. That's very interesting to, to find out. And it, it would definitely make sense because, I mean, there doesn't seem, I mean, the what you're talking about with Mexico, Guatemala, and here in Colombia as well, the narco or mafia or, you know, all those drug related crimes that are basically mafia versus mafia, gangster mm -hmm. versus gangster. That's something us tourists, us foreigners don't need to worry about. Whereas Costa Rica definitely had kind of a, you know, definitely had a feel of being a bit less safe than I was expecting. Yeah, I definitely don't know how, you, just, you can't really know about the drug crime and mafia crime and, and that level of it, unless you see statistics, right? So that, mm -hmm. that's the only way to really know, because you're not going to like be able to like, oh, you know, start like tally, tally, tally. So yeah, when it comes to Nicaragua, I didn't mention about Nicaragua. Nicaragua was alongside El Salvador as the safest place I saw in Central America by far. So El Salvador was insanely safe. I wasn't expecting that, but I didn't realize how much Bukele changed the, the country for the better. That was amazing. Mm -hmm. And then I went to Honduras, which actually surprisingly was more safe than I was expecting. It had this kind of feel of being a little bit unsafe if you're walking around the wrong place at the wrong time. However, that's that can be anywhere. So Honduras sure. for me is surprisingly safe more than I was expecting. And you know, having the tourist foreigner not getting involved in you know anything that would cause that issue. That's that's what I think it it really attributes to. Whereas going into Nicaragua, I was like, I was pretty I, to be honest, like you know, it's that the fear of the unknown. I, I'm going into the <laughs> I drove across the border and I was just like going in. I drove straight to Leon. I went to Leon was the first place I visited. And I was like, man, what a, what a city. I mean, I was expecting like lots of traffic, no traffic at all. The roads are <laughs> amazing and completely empty, except for some donkeys and horses and, and farm animals everywhere. I'm like, wait, wait, all of the traffic from Honduras turned into animals. What is this? <laughs> I'm like, the cars that used to be back in Honduras are now cheap like <laughs> it's nicaragua is often compared to narnia just <laughs> it, it, it was such a bizarre change so yeah i drove into it and i was expecting to see crazy traffic because traffic in latin america specifically guatemala city is insane it's just oh gosh, so yeah. hard to deal with and then i drove into nicaragua I'm like there aren't any cars and i was kind of i was scared because like the change of like so many people in cars and motorbikes to almost nothing and but perfect roads. I'm like, why are these roads so good if no one's driving them? You know, like <laughs> I'm so confused. And I drove over to Leon and the city was pretty big. And I did some, you know, I did some like micro tours before I went to Granada where I was staying. And Leon, I was walking around and yeah, like the cost of living was insanely cheap in Leon. I couldn't believe how low it was there. And um, yeah, the place was beautiful, good weather. And yeah, I didn't spend that much time around there. You could definitely feel that the people didn't have as much money as the other Central American countries. Like it was kind of a, quite a quite a low a low kind of cost of living place with people that were generally in in a type of poverty that you know is pretty common in Latin America, but seemed a bit higher in Nicaragua <clears throat> and Leon. When I was around there, I was like, okay, well, it seems like everyone's pretty nice and calm though, at least. And then I drove over to Granada and then drove all around the country for six weeks, specifically in Managua. I was like concerned the first time I drove in, like I had to do my mo motorcycle maintenance there. And I was just shocked. I'm like, man, the roads are perfect. And like people drive like I mean, super slowly for some reason everywhere. <laughs> yeah, it's a super slow country. Well, if you spend enough time in Nicaragua, it does become apparent that the amount of dogs, horses, cows, Elton from Immense Coffee Movement, he hit a cow recently. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah, like yeah, that's, I yeah. I saw like his Those video, are yeah. real risks. You come around a corner and suddenly there's big animals. People have the right of way. Um, I was out on the road last night, like eight people standing in the middle of the road on in like an intersection in in, in at dusk. So the visibility wasn't <laughs> excellent. 
you could certainly see them, but it was like, these are a lot of people just in the road and they don't get out of the way when cars <laughs> come. People will step out right into traffic You're constantly watching. So the, the need to be slow, because there's never a moment in Nicaragua where you're confident, unless you're in like a straightaway and you can see the fences on both sides, you, you just don't have any confidence that a person isn't going to just pop into traffic. Even if you're the only car and there's nothing around and no reason for a person, I have seen, you know, 18 year old kids take a toddler by the hand and walk directly facing away from oncoming traffic in front of a car, had the driver blinked, looked the other way, had any distraction at all, it would have ran them both over and they would never have seen it coming. They don't look so often. They don't look before stepping into traffic. They don't watch once they're in traffic. They don't look to, to adjust. And so the drivers are expected to handle so much adjustment. That is a big piece of keeping cars off the road and the cars that are on the road stay very slow because there's there's very little opportunity to go faster. And so, and, and no one wears seatbelts. Uh, and a lot of, uh, and on the motorcycles, people don't wear their helmets. They'll put them on their arms. They're required, but the law doesn't say on your head. It just says you have to wear it. So they'll wear it on their arm. Yeah, they'll wear it on top, yeah. facing backwards, just leaning on. I don't. They, there's a there's a an, a very real, I don't know, distrust of safety mechanisms in vehicles. I don't know how to explain it, uh, but self preservation is very low, uh, it and so it's also all be drivers. the point that you brought up in the beginning, which is maybe they're just so accustomed to having such a such a safe country in general. Mm -hmm. Nicaragua is so incredibly safe. Like I was walking around, driving around in Managua, which you would think, oh, you hear about Managua, you think about Managua, the history of you know Managua or just Nicaragua, and you're thinking, okay, well, there must be dangerous places. Like the capital is generally where the dangerous places are. Sure. Then you walk around there, you do you do tons of just walk arounds, right? And it's just yeah, completely, yeah, Managua. completely safe everywhere. And it's just insanely insanely high how how the sense of security is and yeah exactly so if perhaps that's just something that imminent uh, that, that goes right to the core of the locals that they think well my country is so safe you know why even look behind me because people need people are generally <laughs> looking out for me you know, people are in general not trying to do any harm to me because that's just how safe nicaragua is that's that's true. That's true. It's funny doing the walk arounds. Um, I get regular comments on my own channel because for those who don't know, I, I'm a YouTuber in, in Nicaragua as well. And I will get these comments. Well, OK, but you're in this safe place, right? And of course, I'm in a place that someone said was so dangerous already. Oh, don't go to Guadalupe. That's dangerous. So I walk around Guadalupe and then someone will be like, oh, well, that's not Barrio Venezuela. And then I'll be driving through Bar Barrio Venezuela and I'm, I'll ask someone, I'm like, we're in Venezuela, right? I'm like, yeah, I'm like, this is the place people are scared of. Like, I understand it's not like luxury condos or anything, but I'm like, I would get out and eat at these restaurants. If you didn't tell me I was in a scary part of the city, I would never guess that this is what you considered a scary part of the city. I'm from upstate New York, rural upstate New York. Our local cities are way scarier than, than the worst barrios of Managua. Like, are you kidding? This is... There is no part of my home city of Rochester, New York, that is anywhere close to as safe as the worst barrios of Managua. Like it's so, so disparate. Yeah, it's a funny thing. Actually, well, bringing that up, um, I just want to compare quickly my hometown. Yeah. I'm actually oh, yeah. from uh, I'm, I'm from the countryside, so I'm not even from a city. But the city I studied in, I did most of my university studies, is called St. Cloud. And it's it's actually not very safe at the moment. And it's considered to be, yeah, I mean, Minnesota in general, it's, it, it's kind of a safish place. But there are some cities, I think my city is just, it's really like, I think this type of, this lack of safety that the Canadians that are mentioning happening in Canada, this is actually also happening in Minnesota. And I think it's actually happened in my city. I mean, I graduated just as the city, like the demographics were changing quite a bit. And it was kind of a more traditional, like, you know, first, like three gen, third generation white type of, uh, type of climate. And then it slowly started uh, diversifying. And with that comes changes in, you know, how everything works. And of course, I don't know if that's how it is in the rest of the country in the US or if it, the same thing has happened in Canada. But from the stories I've read, that is part of the reason that that their climate and their atmosphere of the of safety is changing is because there's so many <clears throat> so many changing factors 
with the people and the de demographics of what they're used to, which in the past was very homogenous or closely to that point. And mm -hmm. now it's becoming far more diverse and with diversity brings challenges. So I think perhaps that's part of the reason why um, a lot of people are sensing this change in the in the atmosphere. And when you look at Nicaragua, it's pretty homogenous. I mean, the, the place itself does not have a huge amount of diversity, doesn't have much immigration, I guess, besides like the expats from Canada, I guess, from what you mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Nicaragua does uh, it does benefit from a high degree of homogeny. Although it does have two different regions, but those it, it's two very homogenous regions, and uh, I, I do think that that creates um, and and people don't really necessarily think about this. I mean, Canadians kind of think about it. They're like, okay, we have a lot of new people, and now we feel like there's the the you know Canadian families who've been here for a long time, and there's new people, and not everyone wants it to be the same, and that creates some at least impressions of conflict. Uh, Nicaragua does have this this highly homogenous, we're all in this together, all my neighbors are my neighbors feeling. And they're super welcoming to expats, uh, as, as most places are, right? One of the things that, that most travelers say when you're like a world traveler and you're really out there, every country has nice people and good food, right? Like that's, it's, it's, they're nice in different ways. Some people are like super formal, some are super casual, some want to bring you can in. I, can I put it here quickly? Sorry to, to cut you off yeah. because that is, that is definitely a truth up to a certain point in my <laughs> point of view. Because mm -hmm. when you go to places that are super, super exploited for tourism, Cancun, uh, Puerto Vallarta, uh, Mexico City right now, um, Medellin, Colombia. I mean, there comes a point when the city gets to a tipping point where they're like, mm. well, we've been welcoming these guests and these foreigners and blah, blah, blah for so many years, but we see the negatives that some of them bring and that changes our perspective. So actually to me, like I actually, when I'm doing this, this travel, this video series, I'm looking for cities that are not exactly the number one. I mean, I'm going to the number one expat hubs. For example, I'm go going to be doing lots of content in Medellin, but I felt in Medellin, this kind of push feeling from the locals that I didn't feel four years ago and five years ago. I lived in Medellin mm. in 2019, 2020, mm -hmm. and it was far less tourism, far more of a relaxed kind of mixed vibe. Whereas now it's such a heavy tourism place. I think it's even, Colombia might be getting to the levels of tourism that Mexico is at, which is insane, which is insanely high. And so, yeah, sorry to butt, to butt in here, but yeah, that's yeah. kind of my perspective is that basically there are, you do have this feeling in 99% of the times, but there are these like super hubs where either the locals that live there that don't work in tourism, they're like, okay, all these tourists are making, you know, clogging my streets. They're maybe like, you know, making a, making a, a mess with whatever trash or whatever parties they're doing or whatever, sure. or they're making things more expensive. There's all these, you know, these, all these like, uh, reasons for, for complaining or for, you know, not being happy with uh, our presence or, foreigners presence whereas in smaller cities or less touristic touristy places for example where i am now Pereira, i mean it's just not a place foreigners come and when people see me they're like and <laughs> having that having that kind of exotic exotic interaction with the locals for me is kind of a, a benefit i want in living abroad i don't want to be sure. one of the thousands or millions or whatever it is that move to these specific places to have their enclave type of lifestyle. So yeah, definitely I agree to a certain point that yeah, generally generally foreigner or locals in these countries like Nicaragua or Colombia where I'm at, they they love seeing you as long as, you know, the history of that city hasn't been super overexploited. Mhm. Mm oh, that makes a lot of sense, of course. And uh, we see the same thing in Nicaragua, of course, on a much smaller scale, right? Cuz tourism is is relatively low here, but Granada, the tourist center, and San Juan del Sur, which even though it's not the biggest tourist center is almost completely tourist, you you feel a very different experience than if you go out to a Managua, Leon, uh, Matagalpa, where there's very relatively few tourists, but they're still used to them. And uh, it, it, it's, it is a different feeling. That's for sure. Well, Eric, we're, uh, we're kind of out of time here. Thank you so much for joining us. This is fantastic that you were able to make time for the show. And uh, welcome to the first actual interview here on Latin American Living. It's uh, really cool to be kicking this off. And I think a very good start to this. And hopefully we have you back soon. That would be fantastic. Uh, good luck on uh, everything you have going on in Colombia. We're well, going to pop up information about your channel as well. Make sure we're going to put that in the show notes and on on for the people who do get video on this because a lot of people just get audio. 
Uh, but and Got yeah. it. Scott, I just wanted to mention for all the people, if they can log into my channel, I'm going to be releasing our conversation, our first conversation when we first met in Leon, which is quite a while ago, like six months ago or four months ago, whatever it was. Uh, that's going to be the part one is going to be coming up so people can watch us if they're only listening to the audio format or if they want to watch this and then watch another conversation we had specifically about your story, which I think is far more interesting than my story. I talked mostly about myself this time. So let's, <laughs> if you're interested in Scott's story that I was able to ask questions from him, go ahead, check out that part one on Generic Expats. All right. And that's on YouTube, Generic Expats that's on, on YouTube. Yep. YouTube. Thanks for joining us. I really appreciate everybody sticking around for a very different type of show today. I hope you enjoyed this. As always, get down in those comments here on YouTube and let us know what you think. Ask your questions, anything you want to know, uh, anything you want to add to the conversation. And of course, we have instructions down in the show notes about how you could send in a video question uh, or comment either way, and we can put you on the show and add you into everything. That would be fantastic as well. That's very easy to do. I know it sounds daunting, but it really is simple. Give it a try. We'd love to have some of you guys on the show on a regular basis. As always, if you would like to support the channel, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. Uh, like, subscribe, tell a friend about the show, share on social media, post links wherever you can get the word out there. I know so many of you are doing that and it really shows and, and we're getting so much feedback of new people. It's fantastic. Thank you so much. I will see all of you tomorrow. And since we're here on YouTube, we'll have these videos popping up on the screen that you can click on on most media. But depending on the device you're on, they may not be there more because I'm a slacker and haven't gotten to it. In which case, just scroll down, go to the side, do whatever. YouTube's got some recommendations for you. Pick one of those.